Our New Testament reading is Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. So, if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let's now turn to our Old Testament reading for our sermon, Ruth chapter 3. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, should I not seek rest for you, that it may be well with you? Is not Boaz our relative, with whose young women you were? See, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Wash, therefore, and anoint yourself, and put on your cloak, and go down to the threshing floor. But do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. But when he lies down, observe the place where he lies. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down, and he will tell you what to do. And she replied, All that you say, I will do. So she went down to the threshing floor and did just as her mother-in-law had commanded her. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. Then she came softly and uncovered his feet and lay down. At midnight, the man was startled and turned over, and behold, a woman lay at his feet. He said, Who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your wings over your servant, for you are a redeemer. And he said, May you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter. You have made this last kindness greater than the first, and that you have not gone after younger men, whether rich, poor or rich. And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you ask. For all my fellow townsmen know that you are a worthy woman. And now it is true that I am a redeemer, yet there is a redeemer nearer than I. Remain tonight, and in the morning, if he will redeem you, good, let him do it. But if he is not willing to redeem you, then as the Lord lives, I will redeem you. Lie down until the morning. So she lay at his feet until morning, but arose before one could recognize another, and he said, Let it not be known that the woman came to the threshing floor. And he said, Bring the garment you are wearing and hold it out. So she held it, and he measured out six measures of barley and put it on her. Then she went into the city. And when she came to her mother-in-law, she said, how did, you, how did you fare, my daughter? Then she told her all the man, that the man had done for her, saying, These six measures of barley he gave to me, for he said to me, You must not go back empty-handed to your mother-in-law. She replied, Wait, my daughter, until you learn how the matter turns out, for the man will not rest, but will settle, settle the matter today. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. 
Lord, we pray for these words of your scripture, inspired by your spirit, to be made clear in our minds, that they would show us your truth, that we would have greater understanding, that we would have a greater marvel of you, your work, and the work of Jesus Christ. We pray these things in his name. Amen. Up to this point, we have seen Ruth and Naomi come from the land of Moab. Ruth had gone out full, she says, and came back empty. And so the first chapter, we see a lot of despair. In the second chapter, we see that they are not doing well. They have not enough to eat. They didn't plant barley, and yet it now is time for the harvest. And so they are stricken with poverty, needing to go glean, doing the work of the poor and needy. And yet, in this chapter 2, we see this glimmer of hope, this man, Boaz, who may be able to redeem them, to take them out of their state of despair and poverty. This cha in chapter 3, we do see the largest uh, tension in the entire book. Up to this point, it's been, is there hope? Is there hope? Is there hope? And then we see this enormous amount of tension kind of building up and we don't know exactly when we start this chapter up is this the way things are really going to go i thought this was a a nice family friendly story what what's what is going on what is naomi telling ruth to go and do we can see that it's it's kind of a bad beginning naomi is telling her, she says, my daughter, should I not seek rest for you that it may be well with you? Is not Boaz our relative with whose young women you were? These are these qualifications saying she is justifying what she's about to tell her to do. Shouldn't I seek your welfare? Shouldn't I do something good for you? Shouldn't I love my daughter-in-law? It's right for me to tell you to go and do this because it's for your good. In fact, it's right because Boaz ought to marry you anyway. He's a redeemer. And she's giving all of these qualifications. She's justifying what she's about to say. And yet, what is it that she says to do? She says, see, he is winnowing barley tonight at the, the threshing floor. We had seen before that Boaz was a righteous and faithful man, but right now we see that Naomi is banking on him doing the wrong thing. She's banking on him going into an illicit encounter. Their hope for a redeemer is resting on this man, Boaz, and yet she's putting everything at risk. Why not move things along? Why not do what God will... God wants me to be happy, doesn't he? Why don't I just take it? If God really had this under control, things would be better by now. I need to take things into my own hands and make them happen right now my way. The most shocking part that we see here is Ruth's response. She says, all that you say, I will do. This is the height of tension. And there's a few details. Maybe we're overly familiar, maybe we're not familiar enough with the story to feel the tension here. But the threshing floor was not a place for, for upstanding women to go to. It was a place outside the city. As you can, you, can, you can see that even in the text, it says she went back into the city from the threshing floor. And there was um, a habit of prostitutes to go to the threshing floor and offer themselves to the men there. And we even see this in Scripture um, in Hosea 9.1, it says, Rejoice not, O Israel, exult not like the peoples, for you have 
Uh, I'll actually skip down to the next uh, portion here. It says, um, you have forsaken God. You have loved a prostitute's wages on all threshing floors. She is sending in her into a very improper and uncomfortable situation. Not only this, but it's not just that she's asking her to do something wrong or put into a, a situation. There's also danger in this because we know that it is nighttime. She is going out during the days of the judges where people did not obey the law. People, did, people would ab abuse a person for gleaning in the fields even though the law demanded that they should do it. Yet she goes out at night alone, risking danger to herself. And then what if she goes and this man, Boaz, is insulted by her being there? What if he rejects her? What if every, somebody else sees her going there and assumes that she is doing this wrong thing? Then her reputation is shot. What, what will they have then? They had a hope of a redeemer. And yet all of this danger and risk is, is piling up. Naomi's words of instructions, do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. But when he lies down, observe the place, then go uncover his feet and lie down. So wait until he's exhausted, full of food and wine, and he's drowsy. Then show up late at night all alone and lie down with him. Is that advice that you would give to your daughter? Certainly not. Her final words of instructions are, and he will tell you what to do. She doesn't send her with a message or a plan after that. Naomi is banking on Boaz failing to control himself. And then the issue of marriage will be pressed to the forefront. She's not going to wait for him to do the right thing. She's going to expect him to do the wrong thing and then be forced to do what is good for her. Remember, she needs Ruth to have a son by a redeemer. And if she has a son by a redeemer, she has someone to take care of her. Someone to take care of her in her old age. Someone to inherit her father's name and land. But we know that even though a story may start with a bad beginning, God is greater. He is greater than our failed attempts at goodness. He is greater than our failed starting points. For all of us have a failed starting point. And we'll talk more about that later. As I said, one of the biggest points of tension here is reading Ruth's reply. All that you say, I will do. This is the point where in your head you might be interrupting the story like, like, the, like the boy and the princess bride. Hold it, Grandpa. You read that wrong. The princess doesn't marry Humperdinck, he marries Wesley. No, where you think, no, 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 stop, stop, stop. Stop the story here. No, Ruth is, is the righteous woman. She's the, the loyal one. She's the one who followed Naomi for her good all the way to the land of Israel. She's the one who devoted herself to the God of Israel, to his ways. She's the one who works hard in the field, who shows herself to be a good and worthy and righteous woman. Why does she say, all, all that you say I'll do? Yes, I'll go do this. No, you read that wrong. There's a further backstory that adds to this tension as well because Ruth, as a Moabite woman, Israel doesn't have a good history with Moabite women. In Numbers chapter 25, we see 24,000 Israelites killed in a plague because they went after the Moabite women and their gods. It's not a good starting point for Ruth coming from Moab. And further from that, the very people of Moab come from Lot. And the story in Genesis 19 tells of Lot's daughters who didn't have any husbands. And they, needed, they, needed, they wanted children. And so what they did, they waited until they're, they're, they, they got their, their father tired 
and drunk on wine and wait till he was drowsy laying down. And they chose to have sons by their father. This is a wicked thing. And so now we have to question, seeing at this point, is Ruth really this righteous, faithful woman? Or is she going to follow in her bad beginnings? Follow her foremother's plan? Is she just going to be like the other Moabite women that we've read about, that we've heard about? The next section, verses 6 through 9, we see that Ruth does do all that her mother says. But she does all and more. It continues, and she did just as her mother-in-law had commanded her. That just continues the shock factor. What do you mean she did it? What do you mean she went through with it? She waited until Boaz had eaten and drunk his fill, and his heart was merry. That's not an indication of drunkenness. It has a range of meaning for the heart to be merry with wine. But we see that in men of righteousness, we see many men who have had a little bit of wine and their heart is merry. But then there are also kings and uh, of of pagan nations who it says their heart is merry and it's very clear indication that they are in fact drunk. But we can see and assume that as we've seen Boaz's character in the previous chapter and as we'll see his character and how he responds coming up, that he is not drunk on wine, but he is tired after a long day of work and his heart is merry. It says, he went to lie down at the end of his heap of grain. And this is, as I said, the threshing floor just outside of town. This is a semi-public area. Not everybody's going there because it's out of the city, but everybody who has harvested their grain would take it out there and, and separate the, the grain from the chaff. And that's where they would get it. That's where they would do it. That's where they would get it done. There may be other people present, but he is in his own area with his own grain, and he's lying down on the floor uh, to, to sleep for the night. The, and what he would do is the dress of the Israelites, they'd have a tunic that they're wearing, just kind of their normal working clothes, and then their outer garment would be a cloak over them. And when they go to sleep, they'd use that cloak as a blanket. Not just when they're out and about, but that's their standard blanket that they would use. Uh, and so he takes his overcloak off, and he will lie down, and that is his blanket. And it, the text says, She came softly and uncovered his feet and lay down. So she would take that blanket that he would wear as a cloak and reveal his feet to the cold night air, and she lay down there at his feet. In verse 9, he is startled awake, probably by the cool air hitting his feet, and he says, Who are you? This is our first indication that things are not quite going as Naomi has planned. Because he would know what sort of uh, implications are present in this sort of situation. And he is not content with an anonymous encounter, an immoral encounter. Actually, like his forefather Judah, we won't go into this, that account either. Um, but he says, who are you? And Ruth responds, I am Ruth, your servant. See, Naomi says, wait for his instructions, but he doesn't give instructions. He demands to know who this is, who is present with me. And she says, Ruth, your servant, spread your wings over your servant, for you are a redeemer. She's calling back the very words that that he spoke to her in chapter 2. In chapter 2, verse 13, he's praising her for the great things that she has done for Naomi. You came all the way back with Naomi here to the land of Israel, to people that are not your people, to a God that you did not know before. And she said, and he said, you have comforted, uh, oh, yes, and, and he says, the, the wings of the Lord be over you, be covered with his wings, to be protected by him, to be sheltered by him. And she says to him, you do it. You be the blessing that you've called upon me. You called the Lord to bless me. 
So you spread your wings over me. There's actually a, a double meaning, almost a pun here in the word wings, because it's not just the wings of a bird that would shelter her young chicks, but the word wing could also mean the corner of the cloak, to spread the cloak over. And we see this in Ezekiel 16, 8. This is the Lord speaking to Israel. When I passed by you again and saw you, behold, you were at the age for love, and I spread the corner of my garment, the same word for wing, over you and covered your nakedness. I made my vow to you and entered into a covenant with you, declares the Lord your God, and you became mine. This was a way, an idiom, a way of speaking of marriage, to spread your wing over, to spread your garment over, was to enter into a marriage covenant. And so she's not going to him with an indecent proposal. She's going into him with a marriage proposal. She also speaks of herself, I am Ruth, your servant. These are the same words that she spoke to him when he was blessing her. She says, she says you have been kind to your servant, though I am not your servant. This is two things. She has affirmed her status, her, her status of, as his servant because of how well he has treated her. But the word she uses here for servant in this instance was a maidservant when eligible for marriage. And the word servant here is not a pejorative thing. It is not a negative thing. But rather, it is, you treated me like a servant as opposed to the beggar that I was as opposed to the outsider that I was, that I didn't belong here. You treated me like I belonged here, like I was one of yours, like I was in your household. And so here, she cleverly twists the instructions of Naomi. She follows them to a careful completion, but she does not wait for instructions. She acts in a righteous manner a plan that had a bad beginning, culminating to a righteous end. In verses 10 to 15, we see Boaz responding. He says, May you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter. You have made this last kindness greater than the first, and that you have not gone after young men, whether poor or rich. This is very significant to understanding what Ruth is doing here. Because the first kindness, what is the first kindness he's speaking about? She didn't do him any kindness before. He is talking about the kindness he has been praising her about from the beginning. He says, look at what you did for Naomi. In chapter 2, he says, you, I found, you have found favor in my eyes because of all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband. It has been fully told to me how you left father and mother in your native land and came to the people and that you did not know before. The Lord repay you for what you have done. The first kindness was her kindness to Naomi. And so this second kindness is also her kindness to Naomi. He says, you didn't go after any other man, uh, any young man, whether poor or rich. He, he's affirming that you could have married anybody and be taken care of. You could have married somebody who is younger, because Boaz is much older than her. This is not a fairy tale love story. It's, it's a much younger woman and a much older man. You could have gone after a younger man who would take care of you. You could have married for love. You could have married somebody, even a rich man who was young. She didn't need to be there for herself. She would have been fine on her own. But she's doing this because Naomi needs a redeemer to carry on the name of Elimelech. She needs a redeemer to give a son to Ruth and that son would be attributed to her family. Ruth didn't need that. She could marry anybody and be taken care of.
Boaz continues, I will do as you ask, for all my fellow townsmen know that you are a worthy woman. That is, through her kindness to Naomi, through her loyalty to the Lord, through her diligence in working. And she has obviously spoken of highly in the community. He wouldn't be able to say that if people weren't talking about it. And so at this point, we see almost a complete resolution. It feels like the book should just be closed right here. We, there was a bad beginning, and we've come to the righteous end, but there's still another monkey wrench thrown into it. He says, I will do all uh, you ask, yet there is a redeemer nearer than I am. And if he will redeem you, let him do it. And that's, that's fine. Ruth will be taken care of. Naomi will be taken care of. But there's still a tension of exactly how things will go on. And in this we see that Boaz is showing honor. That he will not take another man's place. He will not take this, this, uh, this responsibility of a redemptive marriage when it is the place of another man to do so. And we see that that affirms his honor in this particular inst in instance, that he would not go into an improper int intimacy on the threshing floor. To follow this up, he then protects Ruth, and he provides for her. Because in the morning when she goes out, even though nothing bad has happened, she has done nothing wrong. She obeyed the commands of her mother-in-law, and then she actually would rather further push it further to obey the commands of the Lord. What would people think seeing a woman walking home from the threshing floor empty-handed in the morning? It wouldn't protect her character or, or not her, 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 her reputation before the city. They'd be like, oh... Yeah, she was a Moabitess. Of course, of course she's going to the threshing floor. Naturally, that's what would happen. But rather, he tells his servants there, don't let it be known that the woman came here. And when she leaves, she, he fills up her cloak. He says, hold it out. He fills it up with six measures of grain to show she wasn't, just, she wasn't here doing anything improper. In fact, she was probably working all night long. In the last scene, we see her take this, this grain and report back to her mother-in-law. says, then she went into the city, and when she came to her mother-in-law, she said, how did you fare, my daughter? Then she told her all that the man had done for her, saying, these six measures of barley he gave to me, for he said to me, you must not go back empty-handed to your mother-in-law. We saw this chapter start with bad beginning. Naomi is impatiently trying to force Boaz's hand in marriage. And Ruth, the Moabite, we can see from the context of Scripture, had a bad beginning in her ancestry and where the land that she came from. And we have to admit that we also have a bad beginning. Like Ruth, we all have a common ancestor who did the wrong thing, who stumbled into sin and death. Our father Adam, it doesn't matter what land you're from, Israel or Moab, America or another country, we have one common ancestor in Adam. And he failed. Not just in a small sense, but in a sense that he brought sin and death to each and every one of us. We have the worst of beginnings. We are just like Ruth. And like Naomi, we ourselves have also participated in our sins and put ourselves in bad positions. It is just not, it's not just where we come from, but what we've actually chosen to, 
do in our lives? How can we turn this around with such a bad beginning? That is the tension of life in this fallen world, to see where we've come from, to see the things that we have done. How can we come back from this bad beginning? But in our story that we've read, this historical account, we see Ruth cleverly followed Naomi's advice to the letter, up to the point where sin could occur. And then she followed God's righteous path. She did not give a vague silence, but made things very clear for Boaz. In doing this, she risked danger. She risked rejection. She risked ruining her reputation. And this is all to give Naomi a chance at redemption. It wasn't even for herself. She didn't need to go to the threshing floor. She didn't have to do any of this. She could have married and been taken well care of, regardless if if this man was a redeemer of the household of Elimelech. It was not necessary for her, but it was necessary for Naomi. Without it, she would not have a family. The inheritance and her ancestral lands would not be passed down. They would be absorbed into another family. The family name would not be carried on. And Naomi would have no one to care for her in her her old age. What a picture of the love of Christ for you. He did not only risk danger and rejection and a ruined reputation, but rather when Christ came to earth, he actually suffered those things. He suffered pain and death. He was despised and rejected. His reputation was dirt crucified naked upon the cross, the the ultimate humiliation. He did not have to do that. He was fine. As we read earlier from Philippians, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, though, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. Ruth was an obedient, humble servant, but how much more so was Christ? He was high and lifted up, worshipped by angels, but he lowered himself out of love. It was not necessary for him to do. Not necessary for him. But it was necessary for us. Christ has taken our bad beginning and turned it into a righteous end. Not that we have done what is required of us, but that he has done it on our behalf. And so the encouragement is that whatever you have done and wherever you have come from, there is no sin so great, there is no beginning so bad that Christ cannot redeem it. He will cover you with his own righteousness. Put your faith in the Lord and cling to him. And he will take you and keep you under his wings. Let's go to him in prayer. Mm